Hello everybody, welcome to another deep dive with Decred. I'm marketing lead Dustin Lefebvre. And I'm Jake Yocampayat, the project lead. Today we have a really special guest. It's uh, DCRD lead developer, Dave Collins. Uh, with that in mind, this is gonna be a pretty technical discussion, but as we go along, we're gonna try and bring everyone along with us. So we're gonna start with just a, a discussion to understand consensus code, We'll, we'll start with some definitions on some of the block header stuff um, because Dave, five months ago, made a Politea proposal for some block header consensus changes. So we're gonna dive really deeply into a discussion of those and then um, we'll talk about what Dave plans after that. So Dave, thanks for being with us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, so as, as DCRD lead developer, can you just give us an overview of you know how long you've been in the project and um, how widely your your contributions really are for Decred. Sure. So as mentioned, I'm the lead developer on DCRD, which is sort of the nucleus of the network, the core of it. Uh, it controls all of the uh, dispersion, the funds, has all the consensus rules, which we'll discuss. Um, as far as how long I've been involved, uh, since the beginning, really. Uh, we, before Decred, of course, we worked on BTC Suite. I wrote probably 90 to 95% of that code, I would say, which then is now turned into DCRD. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, that's pretty much mainly what I work on is still uh, on DCRD, as well as the consensus code. Um, so I'm pretty pretty much, I would say, the, the foremost consensus expert on Decred. All right, great. Um, so let's, let's start right there, Dave, with just an explanation of what consensus code really is, what it means, and why it's such a sensitive thing. Sure. So when we talk about the consensus code, really what we're talking about is the fact that every fully validating node out on the network has to abide by a set of rules. And that is what really gives a lot of value to the network because everybody can trust that everyone else, all the other nodes out there, are validating these rules. Uh, as an example, uh, whenever I send funds to you, you give me an address and then I send funds to those address. In order for me to spend those funds, I have to prove that I'm the owner of them. So what the con part of what the consensus rules do is that when I provide one of these signatures that proves that I'm the owner of those coins, it verifies that signature. The, the, the consensus rules will say, hey, if this transaction is spending coins that this signature is not valid for, then it's an invalid block and we're, we're gonna reject it. And because everybody agrees to these rules, all of the nodes out on the network agree to these rules, it creates a, a trust factor uh, that everybody can confide in because there's no way for any one person to cheat without everyone else knowing about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Could you briefly explain to us Decred's treatment of consensus rules? Sure, so in there's a, a few different ways to look at it, but I think probably this question is more directed at the process that we go through. Um, so whenever we want to make a consensus change or a change to these rules, and this is a big uh, key factor that sets Decred apart from some other cryptocurrencies, is that we have a very well-defined process that everything has to go through in order for these consensus rules to go up for vote among the stakeholders. Uh, and so the first process or first part of the process of course is identifying what what needs to be changed um, once we've done that we typically create a politea proposal so that it allows the stakeholders to first have a a vote about whether or not they even want to go down that path because it takes a lot of engineering effort and work to create the the rules and the code and as well as the documentation that describes everything uh, so that people can understand what it is that they're voting on and in order for that to take place, before going down that path and spending a ton of effort and time and money, we generally want to get a, a feel from the stakeholders by giving an overview of the direction that we plan to go with these consensus rules and say, is this something that you, know, that you guys are even interested in pursuing? So once that passes, then we go on to the next part of it, which is where we actually implement all of the, the rules that need to be uh, changed. We actually make the code, we implement a vote in the code, uh, and uh, then create the documentation 
And uh, after that point, this is where I'll go into a little bit more in depth on the, on the process of how that, that code then gets deployed out to the network. So we generally do a, re a new release, which for example, in this case, we're talking about today, we're going to be releasing mm -hmm. uh, one five zero, the new version. So in that version of the code, all of these new rules for the block header commitments that we'll discuss later, they're already in the code, but they're not active. And whenever that the stakeholders then have a new vote available to them that they vote on it. And if it passes, then it goes into a locked in period to give everybody who hasn't updated yet a chance to do so because once the rules change, all of the old nodes were, will no longer be valid on the network. They'll have a different uh, rule set to follow. Mm -hmm. So after that lock in period, then it goes to active. And once it becomes active, those new rules take effect. Um, and so that's the, the basic uh, outline of the process and how it takes place. So there, in the, if you, I guess I should probably uh, elaborate a little bit on the difference between the Politeo vote and the on-chain vote that happens after the code is done. Um, I already mentioned that one of the primary reasons for the Politeo vote is, is to know if we even want to go down that path. But another big factor of that is that a lot of times when you're first imagining a specific uh, rule change or feature, you might have a certain idea of how you're going to do it, but then when you actually go to implement it, you have to do it in a different way. Maybe you have to make some concessions. Mm -hmm. Maybe things didn't turn out exactly how you thought they were going to in the beginning. So the stakeholders need to have a way to actually vote on the final product as opposed to the promise. You know, it's like, hey, this is what I'm going to do with Politea, and then, ah, oh, but this is what I did, and what if it's not what you originally voted on? So we need to make sure that we have that that distinction so that stakeholders can actually vote on the the final real code that everyone is going to run. Right. And and just to add a you know a, a final point on that is that Dave covered the process and just to give people a sense of the time scale, the amount of time this takes should be about, you know, we're talking about a minimum of three months from the time the code gets deployed until the changes get activated. And it could be longer depending on how the activation process goes. Right. So this is a release candidate right now. We're at the start of that three-month process, right, for clarity. Um, Dave, can you tell us a little bit about how you see hard forks versus soft forks? Sure. So <laughs> this one's actually a, a, one of those topics that gets uh, debated quite frequently. So uh, I probably should first describe what the difference is. Uh, in, in essence, a soft fork is a way to make a change in a backwards compatible way, uh, and a hard fork yeah. doesn't. Right. So they both ultimately end up with uh, new rules, but in one case, all of the old nodes on the network, well, I should specify in the soft fork case, all of the old nodes on the network are effectively tricked into following the new rules, even though they really aren't. So all of the old nodes that haven't upgraded yet under a soft fork still follow the chain. They still believe that they're fully and faithfully validating all of the consensus rules, but they're not. They're being tricked. And so, in, uh, on the other hand, from a hard fork, what happens is, is it's not backwards compatible, which means that all of those old nodes, if the second that that new rule is enabled and something is different, all of those old nodes are going to completely get forked off the network. In other words, they're not following the chain anymore. Uh, they, they have to upgrade. They're, they're forced to upgrade uh, if they want to continue to follow the chain. And so, the big difference in that, though, is that uh, as anybody who's probably done any kind of software development knows, doing things in a backwards compatible way almost always involves making a whole lot of concessions that you don't want to. You have to do, you have to make sure that, that things keep working. And in order to do that, you have this really rigid framework in which to work. And so that really limits what you can actually do, what kind of uh, enhancements you can make within a certain framework or within the, the rules that already exist. Uh, on the other hand, when you go into the hard fork side of things, you can change whatever you need to. You can do it in the most efficient way possible. It also in, it allows for much more incremental development because you don't have to worry about the fact that some node from 20 years ago isn't going to work anymore. Right? And so you don't have to keep all that cruft around. So if it wasn't obvious from my description there, I'm very much in the, the hard fork camp. I think that they're superior for, for many reasons. Um, mainly the, the ones that I described. But I do think that probably the other thing I'll, I'll talk about is kind of one of the big or hotly debated topics or points about the two is that usually one of the, the big 
arguments or narratives that are out there is that, well, hey, if somebody's in a coma for 10 years, 20 years or whatever, and they wake up, you know, they need to be able to fire up their, their software and, and spend coins. It's got to work. Well, it, that, that's just completely not what's going to happen in reality. Because first of all, it's pretty unlikely that your computer from 20 years is even still going to work, right? Your hard drive is probably deteriorated by this point. It isn't going to work. So what's going to happen is they're going to, lo they're going to load up the latest version of the software and then they need to have access to their coins. So the, I think that the key distinction there, what is important though, and this is, I think what isn't often, uh, the distinction is not made or it's not pointed out very clearly is that it isn't so much about whether or not the rule changes themselves are backwards compatible or not. Mm -hmm. What's important is, is that you have to make sure that the old coins are still spendable, right? The rules don't have to be the same, but they still have to be spendable. And so that's, to me, is the really the kind of the key differentiator. It's the, the really important part. It doesn't matter if you did it in a backwards compatible or not a backwards compatible way. What matters is if the person that wakes up from the coma can update the latest software and spend their coins. Great. Right? So, Well, thanks for that. Now we, we, we've got a consensus kind of under wraps a little bit. I want to move on and just go through a, a few set of definitions just so that we can take as many people along for the whole ride as we can. Um, so can you explain to us what a block header is and what information is typically conveyed in a block header? Right. So a uh, block header is essentially metadata that provides a unique summary uh, of an entire block. Uh, and, and most crucially, all of that data that is, is in the header is verified by all of these full nodes or fully validating nodes, which I often call full nodes for short. Uh, so all these full nodes on the network have verified that that information in that header is correct. And if it's not, they reject it. So um, what that allows is for people, for well, lightweight clients or really any kind of software that's looking at these headers to be able to trust in the fact that the information that they claim to be true about the block actually is true. Um, for example, some of the things that you, you can find in the block header would be the number of votes that are in the block, uh, the number of revocations, or perhaps the number of tickets that were purchased. So that information is, is in the header, and later on, when all of these full nodes get the blocks, they validate that, hey, this block actually does contain these five votes that the header claims that it does. And so that creates a what we call, and uh, I think it's important to define this now, it, when we when that process is what we say the header commits to a value. Um, and so a, a commitment is really kind of a term used in cryptography as a fancy way to refer to a, a mechanism that provides a, a binding agreement uh, about some key piece of information. And there's also often a hiding property to it, but for the purposes of this discussion, uh, I think we'll, we'll mainly be focused on that binding aspect. Um, one of the most common ways to achieve uh, one of these commitments is a, a hash function, like we use Blake 256 typically. But so the, the idea here is that, so if say I send a file to you, Dustin, and then I send another file uh, to Jake, you both run it through this hash function, and then you can compare the result. It's a very compact, 32-byte, uh, small number, essentially. Okay. And you can compare that and make sure that they match. And if they do, you can be sure that I sent you both the same file. So in effect there, that hash is the commitment to the contents of the file. So that's the idea. Right. So um, now, uh, there are two other important fields, well, three, but I'll, I'll only talk about two here in the header in terms of the changes that uh, that 1.50 uh, introduces. So those two are the what, are what are known as the Merkle root field and the stake root field. So they both are uh, effectively a way to, again, commit to or to um, say that they know what the contents of the block are in a certain way, in a certain sense. So in Decred, there are two transaction trees. You have the regular transaction tree, which is where normal transactions, like if I'm just sending coins to you, Dustin, then that is in the regular transaction tree. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the stake transaction tree, which is where the votes, tickets, and revocations go. So each one of those two trees currently have their own commitment in the header to, uh, there's a, a mechanism called a Merkle tree, but it, doesn't really matter the specific details there. The idea is that it uses an iterative hash process in order to uh, create a way that you can prove that a block actually has a transaction or not. And it creates the, it, it uh, iteratively hashes until you end up with a single hash 
is a very small value, and then that hash is what gets committed to in the header, or in other words, it's put in the header and and validated and verified by everybody on the network. So both of those trees, you have your, your like I said, the regular transaction tree and the stake tree. Each one has its own commitment currently in the header, and those are known as the Merkle root and stake root. Okay. So. All right. Anything else to add, Jake, on that? Um, so 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 right so. The header contains a bunch of commitment data, so so I, I don't think you mentioned it, it does contain a commitment to the proof of work, right? Which is uh, you can validate the proof of work from the header, right? Correct. So okay. the when you hash the header overall, that value, this is kind of what the whole mining process is all about, is that the miners have to find a way to make it so that that header, when the, the hash of that header is less than a specific target value. And right. when that happens, that that's when the rules allow them to send the block out to the network and be valid. Uh, in order to, the other, one of the other fields, this is the third field I mentioned, but I was gonna skip it, but that's okay since you mentioned it. So the third field in there that's important is it, it has a pointer to the previous block in the sense that it commits yeah. to the hash of the previous block. Right. And that's what creates the block chain, right? Because mm -hmm. it creates a chain where you're chaining to each of the previous blocks. Awesome, thank you for that. Let's move on to block filter. Tell us about block filters. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, block filter is pretty much, it's kind of a, a compact and efficient way to determine the contents of a block without actually having those contents. Perhaps by way of analogy, we can think of it in terms of, um, say you, you're at your house and you pack up a whole bunch of stuff into some boxes, and then you send those boxes off to storage. But before you do, you create a list of everything that's in each of those boxes. So later on now, you want to figure out where it is or if you have that item. So you can look through your list and you can say, oh, well, this is in box number two. Um, that's a lot more efficient for you than it would be to get in your car, drive over to wherever your storage is and open up all the boxes and start looking through them and trying to find whatever it is you're looking for. So in effect, that's kind of what a, what a block filter is. It's a, a sort of an inventory of the contents of the block without actually needing the entire block. Okay. And just to give us some perspective, how big is the DCR chain today? And then how big is it if you're running uh, SPV mode? Well, sure. So uh, the actual blockchain itself kind of depends on how you want to look at it. The, the chain is about three and a half gigabytes right now. Mm -hmm. um, if you include a bunch of extra overhead that some of the indexes that are used to do some, some of the block explore things, for example, it's closer to six gigabyte. Um, on the other hand, the filters themselves, if you're in SPV mode, are roughly around 1.5% of that. Uh, so that puts them at around 55 megabytes. So you can figure out if the transactions, that, or I should say, the reason this is important for lightweight mode is that it allows uh, things like mobile clients to discover which blocks contain the transactions that they're interested in. And so the only thing that they need are these these filters, right? So they basically, mm -hmm. instead of having to download, using the numbers I just talked about, say three and a half, four or five gigabytes, somewhere around in there, instead of that, they only need to download about 50 meg. Right. And, and so roughly speaking, we're talking about two orders of magnitude di difference. So it's like yeah. one, roughly 1% 1 of the, you know, of the size of the actual chain is what you end up downloading in terms of the filters. Sure. Now does that, now does that amount include the headers or that's just the filters? That's just the filters, but the headers are only 180 bytes each, so mm -hmm. it doesn't add hardly anything. So, so it's a dramatic difference, right? And so it, it really enables this mobile use, which uh, really, as I'm sure we'll talk more about, enables Decred to be used as a medium of exchange, right? And it's probably really helpful for Lightning Network. Uh, so let's, let's move into the, the block header commitments consensus change proposal that you passed about five years ago, five months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Been working for a while, but not that long. This time machine, man. Yeah. Tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about the origins of, of the ideas uh, in, in that proposal. Sure. So I, I think it's probably, we, we should split it up. So there's really mm -hmm. two different uh, major components to that proposal. Uh, the first one is changes to the block header in order to allow, uh, or to change it in such a way that we can commit to more values. Um, when I was going over earlier and I was talking about the values that the header commits to, uh, currently those values are fixed. <clears throat> we, we, if you want to change them, you have to be very careful. 
Uh, and the reason for that is that all of the header, or sorry, excuse me, all of the miners that exist out there, there's all kinds of hardware, specialized hardware. We often call them ASICs. And so that specialized hardware knows specifically which bytes in the header it needs to twiddle in order to try and solve this big hash puzzle that we talked about before. So you can't move that uh, those bytes, those offsets. If you do, you're going to break all the hardware, and it costs a, a lot of people a lot of money. Um, and also, it makes it a problem for the the pool software and and the rest of the software that has to interact in order for the mining process to proceed. So one of the the key important points is that we don't want to move that's those specific bytes that are allocated to miners around. And sounds like because a of soft that, fork restriction. <laughs> it's, in, in a way, it's sort of does, right? Now, we could, right, because we have the hard fork capability, we could do that, but you don't want to break hardware, typically. So, in order to, uh, to get around that particular uh, aspect, uh, what the idea is, is that we take those two uh, fields that I mentioned earlier, the Merkle root and the stake root, and we combine them into one. So, basically, okay. we just free up the space of where currently where that stake root field is, uh, and we repurpose that to commit to... Uh, an arbitrary number of commitments as well. So you can kind of think of it as, I guess, the whole Russian doll type of analogy, right? So we're going to have a commitment in the header that's actually a commitment to a bunch of other commitments that themselves are commitments to something else. So you, you create this sort of chain of, of things. But the end result is that you have a value in the header that every node on the network has validated and verified to be true, and therefore these lightweight clients are safe to or to trust it because they know that this this is this is not just a lie. It's not something that was invented. It actually has been verified and proven. Correct. And so that and so that's the commitment part. And then have we? Have, did you discuss the filter part already? I don't think you know. We sort of no, in no, passing. Sorry. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the second part. Right. Sorry. Okay. I forgot. Um, yes. Uh, so that that was the the first part. So then the second part of this is that in in the process of making that change, because we already need a, a vote, a consensus vote to make that change anyway. Rather than, as Jake mentioned earlier, you need roughly three months or as a minimum for any vote to take place and the change to become active. Rather than doing this the first change for three months and then doing another change and waiting another three months, we also decided to add uh, an initial commitment to block filters, which are the what I sort of described earlier. Um, so the, and this is actually a really, uh, I, I believe, we're the only ones, the only coin that does this now uh, in, in terms of actually committing to block filters. And the reason that this is important is if we kind of think about what I was saying before um, if, and take a step back, currently what the way that things work in terms of lightweight clients is, is that they get filters from the network, but there's no proof that they're actually valid. Mm -hmm. And because of that, what that means is that uh, anybody could lie to the to the lightweight client and say, hey, here's the filter for the block. And it, it doesn't necessarily in that case have to be a filter or have to be the inventory, so to speak, of the real contents of the block. Mm -hmm. And what that then allows is you can send these fake filters to lightweight clients who have no way to know that they're fake. And then, then that will force them to need to go and download a whole bunch of extra data that they really don't need because it because the the transaction that they're after may not actually be in the block, so by creating a commitment to these filters in the header, we prevent that because it means that the, all of these lightweight clients can check that the filter that they received actually is committed to in the header, or that it that it has been verified to actually reflect the accurate contents of the block. And so we basically close a, a denial of service attack vector by by doing that. Um, as far as the the filters themselves, I think um, the they pretty much also exist. Uh, the initial the uh, original idea for the filters came from the Lightning Network guys, um, so they they have that. But in for example, in Bitcoin, they can't change the headers. In fact, if you were to look at the BIP that describes the the block filters there, they even specifically call out that they had to come up with some other mechanisms that aren't as strong as being able to do a full commitment to them because of the fact that in Bitcoin you can't change the header. You can't do hard forks. So they're completely precluded from doing what, what this vote does in Decred. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's, let's talk about the block header uh, proposal in detail. Um, 
just give us a high level overview. It sounds like there's a lot of security benefits. It sounds like maybe there's some scalability benefits. Give us a, an overview of, of the proposal and the, you know, the, uh, the ERC that's coming. Sure. Um, ooh, I, depends on how much depth you want to go into here, but uh, I'll give it a try. So the, I already mentioned the, the, the way that we're going to combine the two fields into one so that we have this commitment. Uh, another aspect of it that it isn't, we don't have in, we're not adding any other commitments other than this block filter commitment, but as far as what it will enable and what it will allow is that because we went to this arbitrary commitment structure, this will allow us to also add more commitments in the future to the header without having to shuffle things around. Uh, and by, by doing that, it will allow us to have uh, significantly more scalability. Um, one big thing that is, is eventually going to happen is something along the lines of what we talk about are, are UTXO commitments, but it's the idea that you can take the current state of the chain and create a fully validated commitment to it and put that into these new this new commitment structure. And if you have that, then nodes can safely start further out in the chain without having to start all the way back years ago and go all the way through that process. So it, it's sort of like a way to bootstrap, for example. That's just one uh, also potential future way to go. But um, you, you basically, any kind of commitments that you can think of or that you want to, you, we can now put them into the header. So that's one uh, big aspect of it. The other aspect, it, it comes down to the filters themselves. Uh, we already had block filters in, in the old software, but they weren't committed to, which means that it had this, the problem that I just described earlier about the, no way to actually verify them. But it was also using a much less efficient version of it. So the other big change in, in 1.5.0 is that we have a new version of these filters that shaves off, I think it's about 25%, I want to say. So they're roughly 25% uh, uh, smaller than the previous version of them. And they're, from a development perspective, from the people who are consuming them, the lightweight clients, uh, they're much easier to work with and use. Um, and they also have performance enhancements, particularly on ARM, which is prevalent in mobiles. So, so something that I figure is worth m mentioning here is, uh, you, you know, and we've touched on it a couple times here already, is the Lightning Network component, which is the really the motivation for all of this, um, you know, focus on mobile and the ability for mobile clients to sync efficiently, is because of its connection to Lightning Network. So, if you're going to use Lightning Network and do it safely, you want to have at a minimum a copy of the headers and then a copy of the commitments so that you can do things like open and close channels and watch if anyone's trying to steal funds out of a channel. So there's this there's this component where this is part of you know we we view this kind of as the groundwork for you know for what it's going to take to make LN really go. Yeah, given that Bitcoin right. doesn't or maybe can't make that hard fork change, does that mean that Decred's Lightning Network would be more secure than than bitcoins. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I I think it would it would scale uh, nominally better as a function mm -hmm. of that, right? Which is that someone can download just the headers and then the filters, and then they don't have to mess around with any of this stuff in the coin base. Which I I think, if I recall correctly, that was the hack that they've discussed to make a soft fork change so that the f filters are committed mm -hmm. to. But you know, who wants to do, who wants to you know fish that out out of a block? Well, it's also it's not as secure because it's not a completely binding in that in that regard. None of, when you have that, you don't have all the nodes on oh, excuse me, you don't have all the nodes on the network actually validating it. You're relying only on the proof of work miners to do it. Mm. Whereas when the way we're doing it, all the full nodes are are validating it as well. So it's not just the miners you're relying on as as in the soft fork scenario. You're relying on all of the nodes on the network. Um, and then to piggyback on what Jake said about Lightning, that's another good point that ties into the ability to have arbitrary commitments is that some of the common misconceptions and, and or limitations of the Lightning Network that people talk about uh, are one of them anyway is sometimes the difficulty that it might be to close a channel out. Let's say there's a whole bunch of chain congestion and somebody wants to, to close a channel out. In order for you to get your funds out, you have to close the channel. And if there's a bunch of congestion, if you could theoretically delay that close message or transaction from being mined for long enough, then you could potentially steal funds. That's a, a potential attack vector. It's it's pretty remote, but it, you know it it is possible. So 
but the thing is, is that if we, you have the ability to add new opcodes, which through hard forks, which we do, and make these commitments to them, we can also get rid of that particular ability and that asp, uh, that exploit path because you have there are there are ways that you can modify how transactions are signed to alleviate that particular uh, potential. And I mean another thing that's worth mentioning, even though I figure it's a bit of a it's a bit of a detour, and we'll get to it in a future DA, is that you can also do a submarine swap from off chain to on chain, so that if you're getting jammed and kind of locked out of settling, you know, closing your channel on chain, you can also clear your channel out by pushing it from off chain to on chain, which is its own sort of magic trick. So you know, I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities to talk about that in the future. <laughs> yeah, we can get Mateus in here too. Yeah, I'm sure he'd love to. We get we sure. have a, a four way. That would be fun. Um, you want to talk about inclusion proofs? I know that they were part of the proposal. We haven't touched on them yet. Sure. So that's kind of the the core of the trick, I guess, if you want to call it that, that allows you that allows this to work. Um, in effect, you can think of it as just a way of proving that some piece of information exists in a set. Um, so if I have, say, a list of numbers, and I want you to prove to me that that list actually has the number twelve in it. Right. That, in effect, that's what an inclusion proof is. It allows you a very compact way to do that. So kind of like, or in, similar to a filter in the sense that a filter is more or less a different way of, of doing a similar thing, but you can't produce a, a proofs exactly there. One of the things I probably should mention that I didn't uh, earlier about block filters is that they're actually a probabilistic data structure. And what that means is that it will never incorrectly report that uh, data is not in the block, uh, also known as a false positive, but it might tell you that data is there that's not with a certain false positive rate or certain probability, which is pretty high. But say like one in every uh, million blocks or so, it might tell you that some piece of information is in there that, that actually isn't. Um, and so while in a perfect world, you wouldn't have any any false positives like that. By accepting that false positive, that's what allows us to get the size of those filters down so much because by using these probabilistic data structures, they're very well suited to the uniform probability distribution necessary for this. So you end up creating a very, or you can create very compact ways of doing it. Uh, on the other hand, inclusion proofs, they're 100% reliable, right? You know, in the sense that there's no false positives. You know for sure that if this proof says that the data is there, it's there. Yeah. Um, I should, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, there actually is a probability there too, but it's so high that you know, we're talking about the heat death of the universe at that point. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're more, they're, they have a much better probability or, or in effect, you can pretty much always rely on them to accurately report whether or not the contents are, are there or not. But in exchange for that, they're much bigger. They're still smallish, but because you only need them in the case for what we're talking about here, these inclusion proofs uh, work in the header commitments for a way for you to prove that this commitment was included in the header. Or, and then once you've proven that that's included, now you can, can, uh, you can trust it, you can rely on it. And, but those are, they're larger than it, than it would be, oh, let's put it this way. If we were to try and create block filters using the method that inclusion proofs use, they would be significantly larger than they are using the other other method but in a way they're sort of similar in the sense that their their whole kind of goal is to uh, prove set inclusion or you know hey does this set or does this block have this information oh yes it does no it doesn't that's kind of what it boils down to and i and i feel like you know to dave's point here it's it, it, it's uh these filters are a kind of inclusion proof but it's a lossy inclusion proof and it has to be lossy or else you end up you know uh not really benefiting at all, uh, you know, uh, size-wise, right? Sure. If you can never get a collision between these things, you end up having to include almost the entire piece of data you want to do, you know, omit anyway. So, you know, you gotta you gotta lose some data to pick up the, uh, you know, the, comp the the compression gain. Yeah, you you, you can't ever yeah. lose the corner case. <laughs> <laughs> um, can can you explain Gollum coded sets and why it works so well for transaction filters? Sure. So the the Gollum. <laughs> oh, not that one. <laughs> Oh, lovely. So 
Uh, Golem coated sets is the technique that we're using in the block filters to gain that compression, uh, basically that we talked about. Uh, what people might be a little more familiar with are what are called bloom filters, and they're also a probabilistic data structure that uh, essentially serve the same purpose. But from an information theoretic perspective, they're they're larger, and then of course in practice we see that the filters that we've created under the Golem coated sets are indeed smaller. Um, it, but the, the general process that it kind of goes through is you, you take all the information, uh, you hash it uh, with a with a keyed function so that you don't so you can kind of cut out some of the collisions that would be possible otherwise. If people know ahead of time, uh, for example, if people were to know ahead of time what uh, key all of the filters use, then they can intentionally try to create some data that would purposely create a collision because as, as we just talked about earlier and Jake mentioned, these things are, are lossy or there's a probabilistic uh, uh, aspect to them that says that, hey, maybe uh, this data is in there when it really isn't. If people are able to reliably and intentionally exploit that, then you're, you're not, you're, you, you can cause a whole bunch of extra download or data to be downloaded on, on lightweight clients that you don't want. So every one of these, that's one of the big factors that they have is they, they, they have a keyed uh, component to them. And so it allows you to create a, a unique key for every filter so that you can stop these kind of games from being played. Uh, that's one. So you first you use this keyed function to hash it down. And then you take the results of all of that, you sort it so that you have a sorted list of integers basically at this point. And then you encode the differences. And the reason that this works is that if you actually look into the uh, the information uh, probability theory there, you could find that this particular approach is one of the the best information information theoretic ways to properly encode a uniform distribution in the least number of bits possible. So in other words, the smallest way, uh, it's among the smallest way possible to encode. Now, there are a couple of other techniques that are even smaller. But uh, we went with GCS because we didn't feel like the trade-off and the complexity is worth it. The, mm -hmm. uh, the, the golem coded sets are easy to understand. I, mean, I know maybe not with me just sitting here describing them, but for, for people who work <laughs> on this stuff, <laughs> for people who work on this stuff, you know, they, they use primitives that are very easy to understand. As I mentioned, you, know, you basically have a, a hash function, you got a list of integers, you sort it, and you code the differences. That, that's okay. pretty straightforward for a developer. On the other hand, if you look at some of these other things, they're you know they they're, they're dealing with large matrix math. It, it involves pretty complex equations that require high levels of calculus to understand and things along those lines. So, uh, and the savings that you get is very little. Like maybe instead of 55 meg, they might be 50 meg. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I mean, it's not a very big difference in terms of the savings that you get, and we didn't feel like the trade-off in complexity to go with some of these other approaches was worth it. And is, so that's why we ended up settling on uh, GCS. Yeah. Is is GCS proven? And uh, you know, yes. has it been around for a while? Yeah. So the 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 basic principle of it is very similar, as I mentioned, to Bloom filters. Mm -hmm. um, so and all the math that is uh, used by it is has been around for a long time. I think it's from the '80s and much of it. So it's it's definitely not something that is is new or moon math or or something we have to worry about having any kind of uh, exploit in the mathematics. And I should also mention that. Um, in terms of filters, remember the thing that you're trying to prevent or what your, your goal is here with these filters is say, does the block have some information that I'm interested in? Or maybe I should say, does the block potentially have information that I'm interested in because of that false positive rate? So if you could break it somehow, the only downside is, is that you cause the lightweight clients to download more data than they would have to otherwise. Mm -hmm. So there really isn't a huge risk there if it if it were to be broken anyway. So, something else that I figure is worth uh, saying about G, you know Golem coded sets is that uh, you know if we go back to Dave's original analogy where he said you know you don't necessarily want to keep an exhaustive list of every item in every box that you're say putting in storage or you're moving from point A to point B, and instead you keep things like you know kitchen uh, silverware you know on one box and like you know it might be dining room uh, you know uh, you know a PlayStation or something or like that I don't know why you have a PlayStation in your dining room but okay so uh, I can't go back and change that so so you have all the all of this data and the, the, those labels are necessarily lossy so that you know mm -hmm. kitchen and silverware that doesn't mean you know what every single piece of silverware is in there but it's succinct enough that it's useful to us humans and being like oh well oh, 
that's I have a decent idea of what's in there. And then you can actually open the box, aka download the block, to actually see every detailed item in there. Okay. So right. you, you guys had mentioned before that this gives us the ability to verify the proof of work within a block. Um, can you talk about some of the next steps? Uh, how would we go about being able to verify the, the proof of stake component of each block? Sure. So the, of course, in the hybrid system here, uh, right now, whenever a, a block goes out, uh, all of the full nodes verify that everything about it is valid, and then a vote gets cast. And those votes have to, they get included in the next block, and they need to be there, that has to be valid in order, and they have to vote on the previous block. So by doing that, you, you create this uh, scenario where every block has votes that are voting on the previous block, and they have to have a certain number of them for the aforementioned consensus rules to consider these blocks to be valid. And so uh, the one of the potentially tricky aspects when we start going into lightweight mode is, is that Everything that we've been talking about is that we can prove that the that the proof of work is correct, right? We can we that that big hash puzzle that was solved. We can take the headers, we can hash them, we can compare the number versus the we know what the target's supposed to be, so we can prove that hey, you know this the proof of work aspect is valid. But what we can't prove currently without uh, the without more changes, but which these header commitments ultimately pave the way to do, is that we can't prove if the votes that were included. And, and when I say this, I'm talking about from a lightweight perspective, right? Full nodes know this, and they prove it. But from a, like a mobile client, the mobile client can't prove if the votes that the block claims to include are the correct votes. Yeah. So in other words, the, the mobile clients are not validating the proof of stake uh, at component of it. Is, but the, Dave, the full I, nodes can I, are. Can I ask, is it important for the mobile clients to be able to prove that? It's just it it isn't as super important I would say because yeah. the the main thing is is that it, when you have the proof of work aspect it takes a lot of energy and a lot of work hence the proof of work name it takes quite a lot to produce these so you can't just produce these these fake blocks very easily you had to yeah. put a ton of work in there so much so that you almost never actually in practice see invalid blocks because they're going to be rejected anyway mm -hmm. um, and so but what where it does kind of where it would be nice is that Remember that one of the things that we, we try to focus on is that we're trying to make it as secure as, as we possibly can. If we were to include the ability to also uh, um, validate for, for lightweight or mobile phones to also validate that aspect of it, it just makes it that much harder for mm -hmm. some malicious actor to try and trick you. Because what is some, it's, it's very, it would be very, very difficult to pull off, but in, from a theoretical perspective, what you could try to do is you could try to partition the mobile client from the network and direct them to a fake network where somebody is sitting there mining and let's say that they have the exact same amount of hash power. They're also creating a chain. Everything looks completely valid it, it, for all intents and purposes, but they're faking the votes. So mm -hmm. if you could partition off a mobile client in that way, you could make them uh, basically lose track of the chain and it, it, it isn't that big of a deal because they're just going to, but, but it will cause a thing where they're, the people are looking at it and saying, hey, like, why isn't my wallet working? <laughs> I, see, like, I can't seem to send any funds out, right? <laughs> and so you, you can, you can kind of cause havoc. But that would be extremely expensive to do because you have sure. to match or exceed the entire global hash rate of the network. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like it's a, a very easy thing to pull off or, thing that, or something that is uh, really super worth worrying about uh, on, on a grand scale. But, you know, just over time, making it tighter and tighter and harder and harder and making an attacker's job that much more difficult to pull off uh, is worth it. And so that, that's kind of the, what that uh, is referring to when we talk about validating the proof of stake component through lightweight clients. Yeah, and I mean, I guess something, something else to say here, right, is, is that it is. It's just all about sort of closing the holes. That is that until we had these uh, filters committed, the filters could be faked, and if the filters can be faked, you could conceivably create, uh, what is it, I want to say it's a false negative. You could convince someone that they hadn't received funds, and uh, you know that's obviously bad. So by committing the filters, we close that hole, right? So that you know that th that hole is closed by the you know committing the filters. Well, now what the committed filters? The committed filters are there, and there's the proof of work in the you know in the header. So we've basically linked the proof of work with the filters. So you can't create fake pr filters unless you can fake the proof of work. And what would really sort of close you know close the circle here would be to make it so that 
in addition to this, there's also a commitment to, you know, let's say the, uh, you know, the, the, the various tickets. So mm -hmm. there would be ticket, uh, some sort of a ticket commitment that goes in and then allows uh, light clients to validate uh, proof of stake as well. So, okay. you know, we'll get there eventually, but it's the kind of thing where it's, uh, you know, the framework is in place as part of the work that Dave has done. Awesome. Thank you. Um, do either of you, we, we've talked a lot about the proposal, the, the changes. Um, did we miss anything before we go on to the next steps? Anything else you wanted to add? Um, I think that probably pretty much covers the proposal itself. There's a lot of other changes in, in this release candidate, but as far as the consensus changes, okay. I believe that covers it fairly well. Okay, great. Well, let's let's talk about what you'll be working on in the near future because I've, I've been reading some things and I've run across things like Schnorr signatures and things like that. You want to uh, <laughs> give us a peek? Sure. So <laughs> we already support Schnorr signatures, but we only support single signatures. So, and so one of the th if you want to do multi-signature, do you want to do you want to define it first, Dave? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Okay, sorry. Uh, right. My. So a Schnorr signature is is basically another method to uh, create a signature that proves that you are the owner, for example, of some a secret. And typically, that's the private key associated um, with your your wallet. Um, maybe I should back up a little bit and ex explain uh, at a high level how what really happens when you send funds from to somebody. So the the idea of what happens is, is somebody has sent some coins to you, and now when you gave them an address, really what you were doing is you were giving them the public key or the public component of a of a of a key pair where only you know the private key. You, you, you know some piece of information that nobody else knows, and then there's this public piece of information known as the public key that is used to create that address that gets sent out. And so when somebody sends coins to you, what they're really doing is they're sending it to that public key, or a hash of it, but yeah, in, in essence. So they're sending that there. Now, because you are the only one that knows that private key, you are the only one that can spend. But what you don't want to do is when you spend, you also don't want to reveal that private key because what if somebody else sends you sends more coins to that address? Well, if you were to reveal that private key, then everybody else could spend it or anybody else could spend it because they would know your private information. So in order to not reveal that private information, the, there's a, a cryptographic primitive that's known as a signature. So it's basically a big fancy mathematical trick that allows you to uh, prove that you possess that private key, that you know that information, and therefore you have privileges and rights to spend those coins without actually revealing that information. Um, you guys have probably heard of zero knowledge proofs in a way that's exactly what a signature is. It's a it's a way to, to prove that you know a piece of information without revealing that information. Uh, and so that, that's kind of like what the idea of a signature is. So currently the primary signature mechanism that is used is uh, known as ECDSA. Um, and it's the, it doesn't have quite as nice as properties as, as Schnorr does, uh, and the signatures are also larger. So a, a Schnorr okay. signature, Schnorr, yeah, can't speak today. A Schnorr signature is a, another way or another method, another algorithm to create these signatures in a, a more efficient way, and it also allows a lot of, of other type of uh, tricks that you can't do with just plain ECDSA signatures. So. We do support Schnorr already, um, these signatures, this other this other algorithm or way of doing the signatures. However, we only support it for a single signature, and that's where I kind of started before. Mm -hmm. So um, currently, all of the tickets that go through the voting service providers need multiple signatures, one from you and then one from your from the voting service provider. So that way you retain the ability to vote and you give them the ability to vote on your behalf. Um, and so, by doing that, by creating this multi-signature transaction or this transaction that allows that uh, can work with multiple signatures, that's how the, the that process, the voting service providers essentially work. That's how that process plays out. However, uh, the only way to do multiple signatures right now is using that other old ECDSA signature algorithm. Um, so, uh, by one of the, the next big things that uh, that I'm going to be focusing on is bringing multi-signature support into uh, on, on the Schnorr side as well. So it's so that in, in addition to ECDSA, we'll also have the multi-signature Schnorr support. Um, that is pretty exciting, and you know, in the future, we'll we'll, we'll uh, talk about a lot more things. But really, Schnorr signatures are really quite an amazing uh, structure because they allow you to do 
a lot of things that, that are not capable with ECDSA and uh, better scalability. Uh, for example, one of the big things about multi-signature with, um, with Schnorr versus ECDSA is that in the existing multi-signature scheme, you have to reveal all of the pub keys that were involved as well as uh, a signature for every single one of them. Whereas in Schnorr, all of that gets collapsed down into a single value. So they're, they're much more efficient. And uh, in many ways, we'll be able to use that. Uh, and, and really, this even kind of comes into play. And I know we're not going to go into the privacy front too much in this particular episode. <laughs> but it also it comes a lot uh, to play in the privacy front as well. Because once you can aggregate all of those signatures, you can do things like create a single multi-signature over an entire uh, say an entire mix transaction and even bring Lightning Network into the mix. And you can create these, a single value, a single signature that covers all of these different things, uh, and, but yet are still provable. And so it, it, I don't want to go too much into the details there, but it's, it's really the way to go. There's a, it, it enables a lot of really neat techniques and tricks that we can do. Something else that I figure is, is worth pointing out about the Schnorr signatures is that um, there are the reason that Schnorr signatures have only recently sort of popped up in the cryptocurrency context is it uh, is it was patent encumbered until I think it was wasn't it relatively recently, Dave? Yeah, I don't remember the exact year, but it it was. Yeah, I want to say until just a, you know a few years ago, uh, th this stuff was covered by a patent. And the irony here, you know, the irony here is is that it's the it, it is I want to say it's the simplest way to sign things cryptographically and it's and also that you know the, the the technique has all of these nice properties that you can use to prove all kinds of other things beyond the aggregation that uh you know that dave pointed out and no one was really able to use it unless they were willing to license the patent until uh. relatively recently so that's why this isn't something that you know you necessarily see a lot about but academics have known about this for quite some time in fact i think the technique came up in the 80s and then the patent yes. uh, probably got filed somewhere in the late or mid 80s and then you know it's been running since then sure well for anybody that really keeps up with decred i think dave you left enough breadcrumbs uh, on the ground <laughs> for uh, people to put some you know, thoughts together on what that might mean. It's really interesting and exciting. Uh, I do have one last question for you, because um, I know you, you, you said you wrote 90 to 95% of BTC Suite. You value, obviously, multiple implementations of a cryptocurrency. Um, what, when, and how, what language do you think it might happen for, for Decred at some point? Well, I don't know for sure when it, when it will happen. I mean, really, I would like for it to happen as soon as possible. Uh, what we really need is for a team that is willing to do what it takes to, to step up and, and take the horns on that. And, uh, you know, it is something that we'll, we'll support. Uh, as far as I know, everybody, at least on the, the company Zero side, certainly supports uh, alternative implementations. Uh, I personally, as you mentioned, you know that I value them. I think they're extremely important because if there's a bug in one, uh, then you can theoretically you might have a problem where you could take down the whole network yeah. if you have three implementations and then one has a bug well you you know that the other two are probably right yeah. and so you 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 don't have this uh, potential disastrous effect where oh oh my goodness there's this major bug that got found in the only implementation and everybody's in trouble now we we have to go back and fork and uh, go through all this hassle and do votes and whatever you know there's all kinds of things that would come out of it so you can really solve a lot of uh, issues and, and close a lot of potential uh, attack vectors through having multiple implementations uh, as far as the next language i suspect probably one of the best languages to write it in would be rust because of the the type of static guarantees and the memory model that it that it provides, um, we I wouldn't suggest doing it in something like Python or uh, or JavaScript, no JS or anything like that, uh, or C sharp for example, and these more interpreted type of languages. Uh, just because of the fact that uh, when you don't have compiled languages, the the, the number of bugs are much higher. It's it, you you can't get the kind of guarantees that you really need for this type of uh, work. Um, as far as people who are interested in it, I, I will note that it's, uh, just to be perfectly transparent and honest, it's no joke, right? On the surface, it seems like it's pretty easy, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, I just got to track some headers. I got a, I got a few blocks I need to download and save the database. Uh, I got a few rules I need to check. 
And, um, yeah, I got to do a little bit of signature stuff. Yeah, easy peasy. No. <laughs> no, when you get in there, you find out that there's all these different uh, corner cases that have to be handled. What happens if, the, you know, this one, this transaction arrives before that transaction? Or what happens if this transaction gets spent off on a side chain over here, but the other chain also spent the same output? Who takes precedence? Uh, how, what, what about, is it the length or the work that it's based on? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. But the, the fact is, is there are an absolute boatload of very intricate and hard to get right details. So as far as when it will happen, I, I, I suspect we're probably going to have to, you know, put out a, a proposal like an RFP or anything like that and, and try to, you know, find a, a team that is willing to do what it takes. I would expect that it would take a, a team of two to three people that are very competent, uh, roughly a year to, to get a, a functioning implementation, not one that's as well optimized or anything as what it already exists, but a functioning, a properly secure and functioning implementation. It's it's no joke. Yeah, but I'm, we want it. Well, I mean, we 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 we've done it. We did it for Bitcoin, and we thought the same things. I mean, this is also why Dave's got a smile on his face for most of most of <laughs> most of this uh, answer. Is that you know we showed up and we're like, oh yeah, we'll do this. This should be good. This should be really fun. And then it's like, wow, this is a lot of work. This is millions of dollars getting put into a hole and burned. And uh, you know, at least in the context of Decred, we have the opportunity, or we give people the opportunity to not necessarily have to shovel their own cash into a hole and burn it. So we can all burn the money together in order to make the second implementation go, as opposed yeah. to expect it to be a sort of an act of contrition. Well, does, does the hybrid consensus make it significantly more difficult to reproduce? There's more consensus rules. I mean, look it's at our test coverage. Rules. Yeah. So um, you, you mentioned um, BTC Suite. Do you follow that, Dave? Is, is that actively maintained? Is, is that still a, a good implementation of Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the Lightning Network folks are actually the ones who are maintaining it now uh, because I simply just don't have time anymore, unfortunately, with uh, being so involved with Decred. Uh, but yeah, it's still being updated frequently, um, and I know that uh, uh, roast beef is the main maintainer over there now. Yeah, well, that's great to hear. That's a great piece of great piece of software we all value. Um, thank you for being on the show today. We really appreciate it. Um, did we miss anything? I I think we uh, I I think we got we talked about almost everything except how Dave is stuck in the matrix. <laughs> which we saved for, for just at the last the last the last second here and so uh you know i think we're gonna we're gonna have to we're gonna have to save this for a future episode how we got dave out of the matrix <laughs> that's true uh well there's one more other uh, there's one other thing i'd actually like to focus on that is is kind of neat uh is that we're actually working on the for the first time in this 1.50 release we have uh, what's called reproducible builds and so mm. the reason why this is important is right now uh, we we as in company zero build these uh, build the binaries and then we we are the ones that have the key so whenever people download the software they they have to trust uh, company zero and our signature that you know we didn't do anything nefarious um, obviously that's not an ideal scenario for people who are running uh, code that deals with money so by having reproducible builds what this will allow us to do in the future as well is add other people in the community, and I mentioned it in this episode, because if you're such a person who is is interested in, in uh, getting involved here, I'd love to talk to you. But the idea is that you will have multiple people from other, uh, you know, outside of Company Zero, just the other com trusted community members, and they will build the software on their own individual setups, and then the validate the manifest that gets created with all of those hashes, they can provide their signatures. So what that will allow people to do is they can trust the signatures that they want to trust as opposed to only trusting, say, company zero. Fantastic. Well, Dave, thanks for being here. Um, join us in Matrix. I'm Deuce Dorf. He's Dave CG. He's JYP. Dave will answer any question that you ever have, no matter how <laughs> stupid it is. And I and others really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, and we thank you for, for joining in. We'll see you next on the next Deep Dive with Decred Assembly. Cheers. <laughs>